Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and I'm the Vegil Guy. One of the things I love about YouTube is learning new things. It was Grant Thompson's Mini Metal Foundry that got me interested in casting a few years ago and after seeing Nate doing a Copper Gear video the other day, I thought I'd have a go as well and dedicate the video to the King of Random as my way of saying thanks for a great hobby inspiration. As a subscriber, I wrote to Nate the day after his gear video, chipping in my two penneth about how he could improve things. Yeah, right, as if I'm an expert. But I've had amazing results with my casting method with aluminium, or aluminium as our American friends say, so much so that I genuinely thought it might help. He hasn't replied back yet, but he must get thousands of messages every day, so I suppose I shouldn't really expect one. And of course, I've never really tried this with copper myself, so it might not work. So with this in mind, today I'll have a bash at applying my techniques to copper, but please remember, this is the first time I've worked with this metal. I couldn't find a download for Grant's gear, so I drew something that looks pretty similar in size and shape, but it's not very accurate, I'll be honest. I cut this out and glued it to some extruded foam, just like Grant and Nate did. However, I used two thin sheets of foam to gain the relevant thickness. I sliced these out on my hot wire cutter, and, as is my way, I hollowed out the inner core of the gear. Now you've seen me use this technique before, it reduces the overall mass of the foam, and I really think it helps. Then I soaked the one piece in hot soapy water until the paper fell away. Once everything was completely dry, I glued the two halves together. I was unhappy with one of the teeth, I cut a little too much away, so I glued on a smaller piece and let the glue set. I then trimmed this down with a sharp blade and a little sandpaper. It was then time to add some gates to attach my plaster feeders and vents, and these were easily carved and sanded from foam. These gates are both glued and screwed onto the pattern. I then applied a little candle wax to fill in any holes and cover any imperfections, but as this was never going to be a working gear, I didn't go mad. Once cool, the wax can be sliced, scraped or sanded away. You know my method now guys. The bottom flask has a solid bottom, and into this I place some nicely prepared green sand, ramming it firmly into place, but not too firmly. Then levelling it off with finer sand. The upper flask was fitted and the foam pattern was located diagonally. I sieved on some fine sand then sprinkled some loose on top of that. I then pushed this carefully around the foam with nothing but my fingertips. When the sand was roughly to the level of the foam, I gently moved it back to reveal the pattern underneath. I then used a small metal bolt to push the sand into all the voids, compressing the sand but without too much force. Once I'd buried the pattern and left only the gates exposed, it was time to remove the screws. I pushed on the plaster feeder and vent, and these have got a temporary paper cover to keep the sand out. More sand was trolled in and this was pushed down firmly, firstly with my fingers and then eventually rammed moderately using the handle of a rubber mallet. There's absolutely no reason to go mad with the ramming, not using this technique. Then the top was struck off and any loose sand was lightly brushed away. I then took a fine metal spoke and poked some holes into the sand. Now these don't touch the pattern, they maybe finish half an inch away or so.
In the background, I'd had my homemade electric foundry cooking away for hours, and I was aiming for 1200 degrees Celsius. But it's confession time here, folks. This is the hottest I've had this foundry so far, and I don't think the thermal couple is up to the task. It was only a cheap thing from eBay, just a couple of quid, and it's supposed to be good enough for 1400 degrees Celsius, but I don't think it is. When the temperature read 950 degrees Celsius, I could actually hear the copper bubbling inside. So I looked inside, which is a tricky task with the blinding white light, and the copper was liquid, and that shouldn't have happened for another 135 degrees. This got me thinking that the calibration of my thermocouple was off, or that the thermocouple was junk, but either way, I had to make a decision. So at just over a thousand degrees, I hit the button, raised the foundry, and grabbed the white hot crucible with my tongs. I poured it into the feeder carefully, and it was like a fireworks party. I suspect the copper was much too hot. I've got no way of being sure about this, but I suspect it was way hotter than I needed. Especially judging by this very energetic response of the metal, shooting out of both the feeder and the vent. It was much too energetic. And I think this accounts for the poor results that you'll see in a moment. But look at the temperature of the metal in the feeder. The plaster and vent did their job nicely, keeping the molten metal hotter for longer. But it seems too hot for too long in my opinion. I really think the temperature of this copper was well over 1200 degrees. Now did you notice the vent holes that I poked? I'm used to seeing steam coming out of these, but this time there was actual flame. It was really amazing. I left things an hour to cool, then broke away the top of the feeder and vent. Here I'm taking the flasks apart, and look at the drag. Remember, that's just sand you see in there. All those colours are evidence of heat and gases escaping into the sand, which is exactly what we want to happen. The copper gear looked a little bit rougher inside the sand than I'd hoped, and I think this is because of the energetic metal. Martin, our resident casting guru, tells me that if you overheat metal, you can trap gases in it. And I suspect that's what's happened here, with all that spitting copper and rough texture. But the sand is nicely blackened, so at least plenty of gas and heat got out correctly. Now this is the result straight after a quick rinse under the tap. I find it interesting that there's hardly any surface stains associated with the decomposition process, which I typically see in aluminium. Perhaps that's the higher temperatures burning the foam more efficiently. So this certainly wasn't the beautifully straight, sharp and crisp result that I was hoping for, and what I've come to expect from my technique. This meant I'd got to spend more time doing metal work, and I don't enjoy that side of things to be honest, so I'm not going to do much. Basically, as little as I can get away with. And this is the result. Yes, there are imperfections. No, it's not brilliant. It's certainly not as good as the aluminium stuff you've seen me working on before. I'm convinced the temperature played a big part of this, so I won't be doing any more copper work until I nail down this temperature issue. I'll just have to save my pennies and get a more reliable thermocouple, so I can be more comfortable at these higher temperature ranges. But this is my first ever attempt at copper guys, so please be gentle with me, and most importantly, 
I'd never be doing metal casting at all if it hadn't been for the King of Random. So in the very unlikely event of Grant or Nate ever watching this video, guys, you're right, copper is tricky, but thanks for the inspiration and keep it coming. And Grant, if you want this copper gear to put on a shelf or destroy in some elaborate manner, then drop me a line and I'll happily post it to you. Whee! And I think we can call that a finished video. I hope you enjoyed this one guys, and if you did, please like it. If you've got any questions on the subject, please drop me a line. Don't forget to check out my website and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Look out for my YouTube channel and send in any comments, questions or video requests. So that's it for now guys. Thanks for watching.